Good morning, church. Good to see you all here this morning. Obviously, as we've mentioned, we do have some extra visitors here this morning for Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. We're glad that you are here and glad that you get to spend this special day with your moms. Good to, good to see all of you here this morning. Have you ever gotten mad or angry at the wrong time? Ever gotten mad or angry at a really bad time to get mad or angry? Maybe you got mad at somebody who was a family member and it turned ugly. Maybe you got mad with somebody, you know, you're just driving down the road. Maybe you got mad at a coworker. Maybe you got mad with somebody in front of people you go to church with and it was really awkward. Um, have you ever gotten in that position where maybe you just lost your temper and it was just not a very good time to do so? And as a result, you very much regretted the decisions that you made in that moment of anger. So we're going through this series and looking at these people, these heroes of faith, this faith hall of fame that we see here in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going through and looking at a different person each week that are listed in this chapter, this faith chapter. And so we're going to look at another individual this morning who let his emotions get the best of him, and it cost him dearly. And so before we go look at his story and read it in the Old Testament, I want to just look at what it says about him in this faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. And so we're talking about Moses. So here's what it says about him in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's eater. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, they were drowned. So this is what it says about Moses and the Israelites in this faith chapter. And you look at this and you read it, you know Moses. If you've been in church circles for a very long time at all, you understand who Moses is. You understand that he is, in fact, a great man of faith. And yet, as we've looked at with all these other people in this chapter, as we will continue to go through this series, these people of faith, they also had flaws and they made mistakes. They weren't perfect. And so the account that I want us to go back and look at is a very interesting account. It's found in Numbers chapter 20. If you want to follow along, we're going to look at this story and see this event that really changed Moses' life from there on out. Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see this example of, yes, he was a man of faith, but he was also like us in many ways, that he also made mistakes and he had flaws. So this story starts in Numbers chapter 20, starting in verse 1. It says, In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There, Miriam died. This is Moses' sister. Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff... And you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. And so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, 
Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with the staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and where he showed himself holy among them. So this is a very interesting story. We have Moses and Aaron, and they're actually going to intercede yet again on behalf of the Israelites. The Israelites are complaining. They've been doing this for quite a while. God has dealt with them severely in the past for doing this, and he has judged them and struck some of them down. And here they are complaining again. And they should be the ones that are falling face down in front of God and asking for help and, and coming to Him on, and begging for mercy. But no, it's Moses and Aaron yet again. And so they go to God and they say, what do we do? And they plead with God and He says, here's what I want you to do. And you notice the instructions. What does God tell Moses to do? He simply says, speak to that rock. Those are the instructions. Not too difficult, not complex. Speak to the rock. And Moses, he goes up there and he decides that he, he's going to do something a little bit different. And so instead, he gets upset, he gets angry, and he calls them rebels. And he says, are we going to have to get water for you guys out of this rock? And then he hits the rock twice. He didn't speak to it. He hits it, not once, but twice with his staff. Now God, in His mercy, allows the water to come from the rock, and He still provides for the Israelites. But then we see this: what this cost Moses. At the end of this account, now God says, because you did this, you are not going to be able to pass into the promised land with the Israelites. That's pretty severe. And so here's what I want us to think about as we go through and talk about this story this morning. I want us to think about this idea that we should not let the emotional control the spiritual. Now, are emotions bad? Absolutely not. God has given you emotions. God has blessed you with those things. I'm not saying that emotions themselves are bad things. But when we allow who we are and who we are in Christ to be controlled by what we're feeling at the present moment, that's not a good thing. Sometimes our emotions can get us in trouble. And God has called us to obey Him, whether we feel like it or not. And I know that may sound harsh, but our emotions really don't come into play. We are, to, we are to worship God and serve God and obey God and honor God, regardless of how we feel at any given moment. Sometimes we let our emotions get in the way of who we are in Christ. And we let the emotional control the spiritual. So in this story, Moses does two very uncharacteristic things for him. We read earlier in Hebrews 11, he is this great man of faith. We know who Moses is, this wonderful example of faith. We know earlier in Numbers, it says Moses is the most humble guy around, the meekest man on earth. And yet, he makes, some very, he makes two uncharacteristic things here happen. First of all, he decides that he is going to, in a way, take credit. You notice that whenever he's going to the rock, and I'll back up to this, he doesn't say anything about God. He never mentions God anywhere in this whole account. He says, do we, meaning me and Aaron, do we need to get water for all of you guys, all you complainers, right, all you rebels? Are we going to have to do this for you? And then he strikes the rock. He was supposed to just speak to it, but he hits it twice. So now, Moses, he doesn't give God credit. He acts like this is all his doing. This miraculous event where this water has come from the rock that is literally giving water to millions of people. It now looks like that was Moses who did that. That Moses was able to perform this miracle. And he's also struck it instead of just speaking to it. And God says, because you did this, I'm not going to allow you in to the promised land. And so he failed to trust God. He fails to honor God. He fails to obey God. And so this is what happens because Moses, in a way, just lost his cool. 
Now, there are other passages that go through and talk about this particular event. If you were to go through and look at the Psalm, Psalm 103 to Psalm 107 really, is a really good kind of a, here's Israel's history in a nutshell. If you were to go read those Psalms, you would see all the times that they, they did not listen to God, they did not honor God, and, and God continues to show His faithfulness, and He continues to be true to His promise, and He gives them mercy and grace over and over and over again. But you see this in these Psalms. Here's who God is, despite the fact that these people are complaining and, and murmuring the entire time. And you get to Psalm 106, and this event is only given two verses in the whole psalm. But as you go through those psalms and retrace some of Israel's history, this, this event gets brought up. <clears throat> so in Psalm 106, verse 32 and 33, it says, By the waters of Meribah, and I'll point out Meribah means conflict or quarreling. They literally named the place quarrel after what had happened there. So the, by the waters of Meribah, they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them. For they rebelled against the Spirit of God, and rash words came to from Moses' lips. Now, we don't have time to go into all of this this morning. There are some translations that choose to refer to this spirit as being built or being rebelled against as the spirit of Moses and not the spirit of God. Your translation may say his spirit in lowercase h, lowercase s. Some of your translations say his spirit, uppercase h and s, meaning God. And it, it really doesn't matter so much because when we look at this, whether they are rebelling against the spirit of Moses and embittering him, or they're rebelling against the spirit of God, the end result is, here's what Moses does. He speaks rash words to them. Things go hard on Moses on account of what they are doing and how they are refusing to honor and follow God. That phrase there, that rash words came from his lips. In the original Hebrew, it's just two words. And all it literally means is that Moses stammered or stuttered to them. Have you ever been so mad that you just the words just don't come out right? Right? Or you've been so mad you're trying to say something, you're like, ah, 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 and it's just people going, that doesn't make any sense. That's what Moses is doing here. He is so upset. He is so mad. He says, oh, we're going to have to get water for you guys. And he hits the rock. And he's saying things, and he's not even really making sense. I've seen people that will say, you know, I'm not sure that Moses was actually angry in this situation. Well, this is one passage that tells me otherwise, that this context of how he spoke, but also the way that he reacts. I just can't see Moses saying, oh, are we going to have to get water for you guys? Okay, tap, tap, here's your water. He's upset. He's mad. Now, you can make the excuse for Moses, well, if you go back and remember that first part of chapter 20, he's just lost his sister, right? He's grieving over the loss of his sister. He's lost a loved one. He's dealing with these people who will not listen, who will not obey. They should be the one being faced down in front of God, and they're not. And so he has to go do that. And so, yet again, he's having to do this and intercede for him. So there's a lot of reasons and a lot of excuses we could give Moses, but the point is, he does the wrong thing. He lets his emotions get in the way of who he should be spiritually. And so hitting his anger, he makes this mistake. Now, we've looked at this before. Is anger a sin? Is anger always bad? And we'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 4 because we like, like what Paul says here. Kind of lets us off the hook a little bit, we think, when we get angry. Because in Ephesians 4, Paul says, In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. Now, I was thinking about this passage. What if Paul had said the opposite? Here he says it's possible to be angry and yet not sin. What if Paul had said... Hey, don't get angry because every time you do that, it is sin. What if we always equated anger with sin? What if Paul did that? He said, anger every single time. If you get angry, you've also sinned. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. If you're angry, it's a sin. But he doesn't say that. Paul says it's possible to be angry and yet not sin. Now, if Paul had said that every time you get angry, it's a sin, 
None of us would admit to being angry, would we? Because we don't want to do it. That's not something to brag about. Oh yeah, I get angry. I sin against God all the time. I get angry a lot. But because Paul says, yes, it's possible to be angry and not sin, then we're like, oh, okay, I'm okay admitting that I get angry. And sometimes we try to let ourselves off, and off the hook. We try to rationalize our anger. I think, and this is just me being honest, and I don't want to speak for you, I can assume that most of the times that we are getting angry, it's not a righteous anger. We're not getting mad about the things that God gets mad about. We're not getting angry about the things that anger Him. We're getting angry about a lot of things that really, honestly, don't matter. But because Paul says it's possible to be, to be angry and not sin, we try to go, well, I, yes, I was angry, but there's a good reason for it. But a lot of our anger is just not right, righteous anger. A lot of it is just like Moses here. We just blow up. We get upset about something, about the situation or events in our lives, and we get upset. Sometimes we just try to convince ourselves that our anger is okay. We convince ourselves of a lot of things. And it's not just anger. If you go through and you talk about emotions, I'm, I'm mindful of what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17 verse 9. He says, The heart is more deceitful than everything else than all else, and it is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Sometimes we try to convince ourselves based on our emotions. And I will tell you that your emotions, they are terrible indicators of who you are in Christ. Sometimes your emotions are just flat out liars. But we let our emotions guide us sometimes. And sometimes this gets us into trouble in other ways. Sometimes if you're involved in a sin, or if you're involved in something, and you really know deep down it's wrong, but you've justified it for so long, you've made it seem like, well, yeah, it's a problem, but it's not that big of a deal. When you justify it, you get to that point where, you know what, I, I don't feel guilty over this. I'm not sad over this. I may even be kind of happy that I still get to do this. And so in that sense, sometimes our emotions, they tell us something completely opposite of where we should be spiritually. We're okay with this sin, but we really should be grieving and upset and repent over it. And sometimes we're very happy and we're very, very excited, but we're not there spiritually. Sometimes we get upset and we get depressed by things that are going on in our lives and we forget who we are in Christ. So you can see, we can do this all day. There's a million times where your emotions come into play and we think that's who we are in our spiritual relationship. And it's not true. Your emotions are terrible indicators of who you are in Christ. They're terrible indicators of what God has called you to. When you look at the gospel story, you think about what Jesus has done for you. Those things are not dependent, they are not contingent on emotion. The cross of Christ is not contingent on what you're feeling any particular day or what you're going through. God has come, He has sent His Son to earth, lives a perfect life, He goes to the cross, He dies for you, He gives you this resurrection hope, He gives you the forgiveness of sin, He gives you the hope of heaven. Those things, and I know we go through some tough times, and I know we go through a lot of ups and downs, but all those emotions, all those ebbs and flows, they don't change who you are in Christ and what He has done for you. And so we need to be thankful for what Christ has done for us, but don't let our emotions get in the way of affecting who we are spiritually. So, what are some things that we can take from this idea and this story of Moses, this example of Moses? Obviously, if you go back and you look at the story, God isn't so upset with Moses that he gets angry. He's upset by what his anger causes him to do. He says, because you didn't trust me and honor me in front of the Israelites, you're not going to get to go into the promised land. That's his grievance. That's his problem. And so when we think about how this affects us, we need to be able to trust God and honor God in all circumstances. That's, that's what we are to do. We are to glorify God with our lives and every aspect of our lives, regardless if we're having a good day, a bad day, medium in and out day, we're supposed to give God the glory and trust Him and honor Him in all circumstances. Moses absolutely trusted God. 
But in this moment, in his moment of anger, he loses trust for just a second, and it costs him dearly. And the, the, whenever we stop trusting in God, a lot of times that's when we lose our composure. We lose our trust in Him. We lose our composure. Those things are often linked together. And we need to be able to trust Him no matter what is going on, that we trust God. We also need to be able to point people to God and not ourselves. We didn't focus on this aspect of the story as much, mainly because I don't think you and I are going around doing a lot of miraculous type uh, things in the world. We're not doing miracles. This is what happens with Moses. And he has this other involved issue where he's making it seem like he did this miracle and it had nothing to do with God. In fact, he doesn't mention God's name at all. You and I really don't struggle with that. We don't go around and have this ability to do miraculous things. But in the same way, sometimes we like to point to ourselves a little too much and brag about ourselves a little too much. And we really need to be pointing people to God instead. We need to realize that every good thing that we have, everything about who we are and what we have is from God. And so in that way, we need to be able to point people to Him and not make it about ourselves all the time. But we point people to Him. That's the goal. And again, this could be with any emotion, but we're talking about anger this morning with this example of, of Moses. Don't allow your anger to lead to sin and regrets. Some of you may have seen that movie, been, oh, several years when this came out, that movie Inside Out, and this is kind of a Disney, Pixar type movie. And in this movie, we have this little girl named Riley, and what they do in this movie is they personify all the emotions that Riley feels. And so you can see they kind of have all these people, these characters in her mind, and you've got you know, one that's anger and one that's disgust and fear and sadness and joy, and all these emotions are having conversations in her head. And so it's just this little movie about, you know, here's what's going on with this little girl, and it's, let's just see, here's some of the things behind the scenes. We all have these emotions. Well, you can probably recognize anger there with the red hot anger. In this movie, there's a scenario where anger has kind of gotten the best of Riley and has caused her to do some things that she shouldn't do. And in this moment, anger actually stops. This character that's personified as anger. Anger stops and looks at what it's made Riley do. And anger says, what have we done? What have we done? Anger is one of those emotions that we sometimes don't realize the consequences until it's too late. I've never met anybody that says, you know what, I'm really, I'm awful proud of decisions in the way that I've acted when I've been angry, right? I've never seen anybody do that. Say, yeah, I really blew up with those people the other day, and I made some really great decisions right after that. It never happens. <laughs> Anger is one of those things that we often regret. We regret what we have done in anger. Sometimes we let our emotions get the best of us. And it affects who we are spiritually. So I want to encourage you, once again, do not let the emotional control the spiritual. Don't forget who you are in Christ. Don't forget what God has called you to. It's okay to have emotions. God gave you those things. But don't let those things control who you are in Christ. And so I simply want to encourage you this week to focus on the cross instead of your emotions. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, and to study your word, to enjoy this fellowship, and be a part of your family. Father, we know that you have called us to great things. You expect great things from us as your people, as your church. Father, help us to be mindful of those things and help us to understand that regardless of what we're going through, regardless of what kind of week we're having, what kind of day we're having, what kind of year we're having, Father, you have called us to obey you, to submit to you, and to live for you, that we honor you and serve you in all that we do. And so, Father, help us to be mindful of the fact that no matter what we are going through, no matter what emotions we are feeling, we are first called to honor and praise you. 
So, Father, help us to be mindful of those things. Help us to not allow our emotions to get in the way of serving you and doing things that we might later regret. Help us to be able to focus on you, to focus who we, about who we are in Jesus, to focus on the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope and the example that we have through him. It's through his name that we pray this morning. Amen.